This video is made possible by our sponsors, AJA. We'd like to thank AJA for all their support and tell you to go to AJA.com for all your production and post-production needs. Hi, I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify existing skill set. You can learn more at FilmmakerU.com or, of course, follow us on Twitter at Filmmaker underscore U. Every week, we interview a film professional to discuss their work. And this week, I'm joined by editor Owen McGurk, whose work includes The Lobster, Miss Scarlet and the Duke, and more recently for AMC, Kin, just to name a few shows. Uh, welcome to the show, uh, Owen. Uh, thanks for having me, Gordon. Um, I guess my my first question is, you cut The Lobster, which was, oh. I remember a lot of people loved, but it is a very high concept film in the oh, sense of let like, me stop you there I, I was the first assist in oh okay after. i didn't oh, cut, sorry. i can tell you all about that as a job because it was a fascinating sure. job but no i couldn't take credit for that that was a guy called uh yorgos mavropsaridis who's who goes by the name blackfish who always cuts uh yorgos lanthimos's movies um so i didn't i didn't cut the lobster but i did i did uh but I was there, and uh, I I loved working on the lobster. It was a, uh, it was a. Uh, I'm sure. Well, the, when the script kind of came, when I got the script, I was like, oh well, I have to try and get on this because that was it's not too often you get said things like that. But go on, what were you going to well, say? About I was going to say it's such a high concept. <laughs> it's such a high concept idea of yeah. like. And so how do, you, what were the discussions like in the cutting room about making this believable? Right, because it, if you t pitch it to someone, they're going to be like, "Whoa, <laughs> I don't know if that'll work." Well, I don't, I don't know. Now, now, in terms of, in terms of how now again, because I wasn't discussing it. Yet, did my whenever I was talking to Yorgos, the to Yorgos is here, Yorgos the director, it was usually about technical things to answer. Could we do this? Could we do that? So. In terms of the concept, in terms of talking myself and uh, Blackfish, the editor talking about, I, well, I'm somewhat familiar with, um, I'd, I'd seen Dogtooth, uh, I hadn't seen Alps, or maybe I'd watched it just before we started filming. So I'd seen Dogtooth and actually I had lived in Greece for a little bit when I was, uh, when I left school. Um, so I had a, a little bit of a knowledge of Greek and I, I saw I. I was aware of the, or is somewhat aware of the, the kind of acting style and that creation of a, a self-contained world with its own rules that 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 York Slatimus had done with Dogtooth. I was very curious to see that in a an English language uh, situation. But I, 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 what I would say is, I think the film itself, sort of the story itself it it sets out its rules like any kind of fantasy world in a very clear way so you either just like watching Alice in Wonderland either you're up for the idea that there are talking animals and if you eat things and drink things you will grow and and shrink and and then you're in Alice in Wonderland and you're 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 there with that that world's rules and obviously the rules of the lobster while odd are quite clear basically if if these people, these single people don't find a mate within 30 days or 40 days or whatever it was, they will get turned into a, um, a, an animal. So that, that I think is stated pretty much up front and you, and you, and what you observe is how, how people would behave in a situation like that. And, and, cause obviously, you know, it's, um, obviously there's so many examples of, you never know, like there's lots of things of you never know how you would behave in an, an, a, a place with odd rules or odd laws. So it, I think the story itself sort of dictated that. But oh, what was I going to say? Um, um, what I will say is one of the things that I thought was, um, uh, was interesting about it, which I, I tried to get out of the writer who was there on set as well the whole way through the shoot was I had always imagined that maybe there was a more horrific thing going on in the lobster was that the transformation room you know where people are meant to be transformed into into animals I I wondered was that all just uh, an illusion that essentially it was a bit more like Logan's run or 
you know, or more horrifically, like 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 Auschwitz, essentially, that that there was the shower room in Auschwitz, that these people were just being, they were just being told they were going to be uh, transformed. But in terms of, so that was the only conversations I ever had, I, but I, I never got a, an answer. I didn't really expect a, a direct answer to that question, whether whether it was real. But I think that I think the film is interesting in that it allows you to look at it both ways, not, not in a like, you know, sometimes there's a fake ambiguity you get in some things you're working on where they just don't know what it's about and they like to leave it unclear and let the audience decide or something, which is I always think is a cop out. But I, actually, a better way of doing it, I think, is like the lobster, where there are, there are two ways you can look at this, and both make sense, and you can you know swish back and forth but uh but there you go i don't know does that answer the 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 question i'm not i'm not sure i think so like like you said like if we think about you know uh alice in wonderland or any of those other books or well, i guess wizard of oz another example right i, I love wizard of oz one yeah. of my, my favorite movies of all time yeah and I, I loved the books as a kid but yes yeah yeah like they they all have yeah, you know, when you're in uh, in Oz, it's not kind of, well, she says we're not in Kansas anymore. And then then you're told, well, you have to you have to follow the way Yellow Brick Road and you, you have to go and see the wizard. And these are the things you must do in this place. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm going to interrupt this interview for one second. We want to thank Pixelview, one of our sponsors. They're a streaming solution for filmmakers. Pixelview lets you stream your work to remote clients for easy collaboration, and it works with both on-set teams and post-production teams. With built-in video chat, you can discuss and make changes in real time and stream directly from your editing software. Or you can use the hardware encoder to stream from DaVinci Resolve or the camera on set. See the promo code and the link in the video description below. Well, and I guess like from a storytelling point, you're always setting up rules. Like, you know, if we mm. think about any film or any show, like do, do you take that when you approach a, a, a show or movie you're working on? Like what are the rules? Are we laying them out properly? Or is that just uh, something with more high concept? I think that's more important when you have something that's fantastical because then you know if it's nothing it's just nothing like observable life then it it runs the risk of if there are no, there's nothing to give the drama any traction i think you probably need rules more in um yeah in, in things like the lobster than you would you know it, it, well i i should suppose i I, th I think the thing is that if they're fantastical they need to be stated if they're not things that we understand to be just like our world then yes that they, they they must be stated but but i suppose you know in, in terms of say something like with scarlet and the duke which is a kind of fantasy version of of victorian london where where you know because there were no female detectives like with scarlet but you know so we understand i suppose we understand a little bit like a jane austen like like the you understand you don't you know if you're reading pride and prejudice you understand oh women are subject to different rules in this society than they would be now and and that affects their decisions and, and what they're capable of so yeah i suppose to some to some extent that is always the case but i suspect that that's more more an issue with things that are yeah fantastical i suppose and like like say Star Wars, you know, you get a big you're always being explained what the force is and isn't in that first Star Wars movie. And yeah, if you if you don't know, well then it could be just anything. And if it's just anything, maybe it just floats away and it's not it's not um uh, well I suppose Superman's a great example or or Achilles, you know, Achilles, if Achilles can just kill anybody, he's boring. But if he's got this one weakness and we, you know, it's and with Achilles, it's established from his birth. His mother dipped him in the river, but she held him by the ankle. So if he, if he gets, if he gets, that's his one weak spot. But without that weak spot, I don't suppose Achilles is so interesting as a character. He's, he's just meh. <laughs> How has your early experience on, um, in film and, and assisting and everything helps you sort of work your way up uh and how does that still influence you as a an editor 
Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think for like there's obviously two schools of thought, you know, that, that you should try and go in as high as possible, as quickly as possible. And, and that's not how I did it. I worked my way up as an assistant. And for me, that was the right way to do it. Uh, um, that's uh, as in certainly in terms of I, I had been as soon as I left college, I was editing kind of TV broadcast TV programs for Irish TV and but then the and I I done bits of camera work and I I done bits of this ADing assistant directing and but it but the first chance I got to work in a curry room on a drama which is it was a thing called John uh Bachelor's Walk which is directed by John Carney who's since directed um he he was made once in Sing Street and he, I think he has a new film out that just did really well at um Sundance uh so he, it was it was a TV show kind of created by him and it was my first experience of being in a, a drama cutting room and immediately I kind of knew that I, that was where I wanted to be uh that that was the thing that I liked to invest but also immediately knew that there was a lot that I felt I needed to learn before I could cut myself. So in terms of how how that worked its way out, yeah, I suppose it was it was very interesting that I suppose at the time when I became an assistant, there were still a lot of film editors around. So as an assistant, you just had you often knew how to had to know how to use the software and use the computers because but that would be something that would be would have been more native to me than some of the people I were working for. Like so, what, some editors that I worked for basically couldn't work their own phones. So you would you would be often working the the opera, apparatus for them, which was great. But I suppose that the other thing was that um yeah, there were lots and lots of things that I learned as an assistant that I sort of that I use every day uh as an editor um n- not li- whatever about the kind of various you know tricks you pick up along the way f- just from observing editors working or assembling for them which is, a, is a, i suppose assembling for another editor is a great way of learning because you you get to cut but in a pressure-free way whereby they will take your work and if they if they're happy with it they stick it in the show that's great but if they're not, they'll change it, make it better, and you get to see what they've done. And, and that, you know, that was always really instructive. But I suppose the thing that's kind of harder to quantify is observing really good editors and just seeing them work and seeing them deal with the the politics of, of filmmaking, because there's an awful lot of things that you just don't know until you go through in certain kinds of situations, whether there's a problem on set or there's a problem with the script or um, these things, how to sort of head these things off. Uh, You know, when you get to the fine cut, if there's problems between say what the producers or the financiers want and what the director wants, how to navigate those situations. I I mean, because you know, uh, like the editor's there to to help solve problems. So, so you definitely don't want to be someone who is creating more problems. And and I've certainly seen, I certainly got to see. You know, you learn from people doing it right, but you also get to see people make mistakes. And I certainly, I certainly took it that I remember any time I saw editors dig their heels in and make a an argument or a fight out of anything that I, I think that's a losing, a losing position for an editor because ultimately your, your editors never have final cut. You know, there is the directors above you, the producers above you, the financiers above them. There are layers of decision makers above you. So you have to be, you have to be willing to compromise. You know, it's one of those things where you've got to passionately feel that you're doing the right thing until the moment someone says, I don't like it like that. I want it different or better. Or, and you just go, okay, well, okay, I've got to try and make that work now. And uh, in my experience, well, certainly as an assistant watching, I, I was always 
keenly aware of that the editors I thought were best were the ones who were just didn't weren't too wedded in an egotistical way to their work. They took their work very seriously, but ultimately they, you know, they weren't afraid to admit they were wrong or 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 weren't afraid to admit that there might be a better way of doing things than the, the way they had done it already. And I think, yeah, you can't be too precious about your work. You have to, you know, strike a balance of caring about it deeply, but being willing to change it. Uh, yeah. But um, yeah, so I, I definitely, and that, that it was kind of hard to, I suppose that, that in terms of how, working as an assistant how you learn that you learn that just by I suppose being at the back of the room and observing things or being party to certain conversations or decisions and it's sort of I don't know like a lot of learning you just sort of pick it up as you go just by paying attention uh I I I think it's one of those places cutting rooms are like they're great because there's so many decisions and so there's so many contingencies to every decision and there's so many different kinds of situations. But I suppose because these decisions are happening all the time, I, I kind of like to think that anybody who's who's sufficiently enthusiastic will pick up, pick these things up and learn a lot while they're here. But and I, I think that's what happened with me. <laughs> you know the way it's one of those things I think people always imagine that stuff that they've learned was somehow innate to them I, I suspect I've learned most of the things I know yeah, I'm not sure that I was insane and in, in, born an insanely talented editor or, or that I'm that anyway like but it, but that you can learn these things I mean how good you are beyond that is is a whole different uh, uh, that there, there are other there things that come into play I suppose but yes I I am I don't know yeah I definitely feel shaped by my time as an assistant mm. now because you do a lot of crime drama <laughs> and... I have to, I was thinking about that today because yeah I have it's quite busy at the moment and there's the, whatever I'm doing a crime show at the moment and I'm I'm being offered two other crime shows and, and a comedy uh, after this, but I'd love to do the comedy. I'm not sure that the uh, the um, that's going to work out dates wise, but I don't know why that is. Uh, um, I I like crime shows, but uh, uh, yes, I, I I think I think like anybody like 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 actors or whatever, like people see, oh, you do this thing, and they imagine that that's the thing you do, or. Yeah, I've done I've done several crime shows in a row now. Yeah, it feels like I've done an awful lot of crime over the last few years. Uh, yes, um, I, I it was it wasn't something I, I sought out. I mean, they, they make a lot of crime shows. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's those, it's a very it's popular a, genre. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, yeah, it's funny for me because like. Uh, you know, growing up, uh, I mean, the first film I saw in the cinema was like Star Wars. And so I loved science fiction and I loved monster movies and horrors when I was a kid. Um, I, I love musicals, I love all sorts of genres. But for whatever reason, yeah, crime has been the thing that I've been doing the last, particularly the last three or four years. So that might not stay that way, but we'll, we'll see. <laughs> I suppose if you're saying in terms of rules and crime, yeah, are there are there rules for cr cutting crime? No, uh, no. I said, you know, it, like it, it's one of those things. Like, uh, like obviously, broadly, both kin say that the AMC show uh, and uh, and um, Miss Scarlet are both crime shows, but they're very different in, in tone. Um, in terms of how you cut them. You know, it's funny like I mean there's there's I like I don't have a specific style that I I bring to any show that I'm on the the, the way I see it is that I sort of interpret the script the performances the camera work and and I have to know there are different there are different types of cutting that suit certain kinds of genres it I always feel it's my my job to master as many different styles as possible so that so that I can use them when I need like say like same as Scarlet like it's it it 
definitely, you know, obviously there are tension moments of, you know, you know, uh, where bombs are ticking and someone has to defuse it and there's a race against time and you have to be able to know how to cut those kind of sequences. But equally, there's it's obviously a romantic show in that, you know, there's a will they won't they um, relationship between the two main characters, Scarlett and Duke. And so you have to be able to know how to do that. And then there's a comedy element to it. And it has a kind of, actually one of the nice things, actually one of the touchstone kind of things when, when I first talked to um, the producers about it before I did the first series, uh, one of the touchstones they said was Moonlighting, the, you know, the Civil Shepherd and Bruce Willis show from the 80s. And it sometimes has that kind of feel of being very light and almost like a screwball comedy kind of pacing to some of it. So then you have to know how to, within that one show, you have to know how to handle all these different kinds of moments, which may ordinarily belong to different genres, you know, uh, um, like, 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 I, 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 actually it was funny doing Kin, and Kin's a gangster show, and obviously that has crime elements too, but it then certain scenes you know if you have someone following someone down a dark alley then it suddenly becomes almost more like a horror film and uh, and so you need to know how to uh, handle that kind of a moment as well like um um but uh yes what what is it about crime things that people keep asking me to do crime? I'm, I'm not sure <laughs> I have no, I have no personal experience. I'm not, I don't have a, a vast personal knowledge of, of crime. That's for sure. Um, is so in your career? Is there a particular scene or or moment in the in a show or film that was difficult to edit, but you're really proud of how it's turned out? Oh, what made it difficult? Okay. Oh well, I know the first thing that jumped into my head is, it, and again, it's another crime show. Was a thing that I did last year uh, called so it's, it's the show is called Maxine it was for British TV and it's about I think it's going to be on Netflix or maybe Britbox in America um, but uh, um, wherever they show British shows I think it, it's going to be, uh, be on that uh, in America but it's it's a it's a it was a kind of true crime thing about based on the a terrible case in Britain 20 years ago, which was the death of two schoolgirls. And then um, um, basically they were, the, the, they, it turned out that they had been killed by the caretaker of their school and his girlfriend, Maxine Carr, had been their school assistant, so had known the two girls. So it was a, it was a quite, um, yeah, it was a really tragic case. But anyway, we made a, a three-parter kind of, dramatization of without ever showing the two girls it was called Maxine so it's kind of it's not exclusively from her point of view but a, a little bit because she wasn't directly involved in the murders but she she helped um she helped cover for Ian Huntley her boyfriend she she was his alibi essentially so there was one thing that was uh it was quite difficult to do which was the the kind of climax of the second episode um, you know, everything seemed to be going well. The climax of the second episode is essentially where the police come and catch. Or it, it was it was where actually as written, what it was was the police find the piece of evidence that will lead to um to them catching uh, uh Maxine and Ian. And then episode three began with them being arrested. And I suppose everything seemed to be working fine and and then on the Friday afternoon where we were set to show our version of, of the episode to um, the execs, the director at lunchtime came up with the idea. She's like, oh, it's, it's all working really well. We're really happy with the episode. But she was just like, oh, them finding the bit of evidence. And she just said, just said, would it be better if we finished on the arrest? And, and uh, as soon as she said that, it was one of those things we go, Oh, well, of course that would be better. But then you think, all right, well, now I know what I have to do. I have to take the opening scenes from what is the opening of the following, the subsequent episode, and I now have to create a sort of montage sequence to, to, to meld together things that weren't designed to go together, but to create a climactic moment 
in um, at the end of that episode. And basically because it was lunchtime on a Friday and we had a deadline, we had to do it in the space of, you know, three, four hours. So it was one of those moments where I, I'm very pleased with how it really worked. And it was it was so much better, I think, than it was it was on the page. It, it made far more sense. And I suppose it was one of those things where once you start doing it, there's no way back. You're like we had no time. If it didn't work, we had no time to fix it. So it just had to, it had to work. And there was a, a lot of music work to do and a lot of effects work to get it all, but get again to tie these things that weren't designed to go together into one one movement. And uh, I suppose the the proof of its success is even though it meant restructuring both the end of the second episode and the start of the first the third episode not once did any exec make any comment about it they just accepted it completely first time and uh yeah and i'm, I'm watching that recently because it went out to telly here in ireland uh, a couple of months ago and i was watching that with my son and i was like oh that that works and it was tricky to do and it was it was tricky to do fast and I suppose working in TV you sort of as part of the job is you have to be able to do good work fast so that's a recent one that I'm I'm pretty pleased with also I, th I think it, it like just emotionally it hit home it, it just made sense as the end of the episode well that to, to to finish on them being arrested and and dragged away was a so much more a climactic moment and it meant and actually it improved the start of the third episode too so uh um yeah because then the third start of the third episode was essentially the the finding of the girls bodies and that made far more sense that it was given more prominence than it had been in the scripts so there you go that's one that i'm pretty happy with <laughs> and it's, yeah. it, maybe there's a bit of recency bias with that. It's like, I just watched that on TV <laughs> just a few weeks ago. And it was pretty, I don't, I don't watch things like to watch my own editing or anything like that. But I, 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 I it, you know, we, I only cut it last year. So I'm still aware of the work and, and the feeling of that day of racing against the clock together. Right. So, so uh, yeah, it's one of those things. I'm pretty happy with that one. Yeah. <laughs> So what would you say is your favorite guilty pleasure film or TV show to watch? <laughs> well, I'm going to slightly cop out of this, right? Because when now I, I come, well, the, when I was growing up in Ireland, Ireland was a very Catholic country and there were lots of things that, that Catholics feel guilty about. So I'm not going to feel guilty. <laughs> I will say I, I'm not, uh, I, actually in another way, you know, obviously people use the, the word Catholic as universal. I have, have um, I'm not a snob in terms of what I watch. I think I have a very kind of varied palette and I have no problem watching foreign language films or musicals or romantic comedies or anything. I, I, I don't uh, I don't feel guilty about any of them. I, I, what I will say is and, and I'm, uh, is that as a teenager, one of the things I came across was a book called Joe Bob Briggs Goes to the Movies. And it was a book of drive-in movie criticism uh, by a fictional drive-in movie critic, but the films were real and it was full of things like, you know, Mad Monkey Kung Fu and Evil Dead. And, and as a teenager, I, I loved this character who was a Texas drive-in movie critic. And I would, and you, obviously there are no drive-ins in Ireland. People didn't have so many cars and, uh, uh, but I did love trying to track down these movies in uh, video shops as a teenager, but I never felt guilty about it. But I did watch an awful lot of very trashy, very fun <laughs> movies. <laughs> well, thank you so much for letting me interview you today. And not at all, not at all. Uh, yeah, that was fun. Well, that's it for this week, everyone. Make sure to check us out at filmmakeru.com or of course, follow us on Twitter at filmmaker underscore you. I'm Gordon Burkell. Thanks for watching. This video is made possible by our sponsors, AJA. We'd like to thank AJA for all their support and tell you to go to AJA.com for all your production and post-production needs.